think I would first give the word to Angelina. If you have a question or a comment on uh, Maria's talks, I think you do. <laughs> so, or I saw you writing down a lot of lot of comments, perhaps. So, do you want to uh, comment on what was said? Yeah, I actually have so many reflections, uh, questions that I don't know from where to start. <laughs> um, okay, let's start with um, with the context of the Eastern Europe. Uh, when you said that, uh, because I'm from Poland, I mean, I, 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 I maybe someone thinks that I'm from Barcelona because <laughs> the, uh, I'm based there and 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 I, I'm speaking right now. Of, I, I spoke from from this position, but originally I'm from I'm from Warsaw. And uh, when you were talking about this, uh, about that, normally we look uh, um, or give the examples of organization, bottom up, and so on, the civil society. Uh, we do not look uh, uh, into our own uh, history, and I remember um, when I uh, have read, uh, have read the, the article of Don Kalb about actually the origins of the far right in Poland, and I remember that uh, there is also like a hidden story of uh, such a, something that would could be called uh, municipalism because uh, they were workers uh, who wanted to take over the cooperatives. They wanted more democracy from the leftist pr principles. They didn't want uh, the neoliberalism and stuff like that. But uh, to hide this, all the, that stories of uh, self-governance is, 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 is another like political function to uh, close the debate about that. Um, so uh, that was the first thing I thought, uh, but then I um, uh, like this is one part of the story. But then young people of our uh, from our generation, I remember when they were uh, they didn't want to uh, make bridges between, for example, Southern Europe, uh, Greece, Spain, Italy, when, where people are like fighting back uh, in a more visible way than people from Eastern uh, Europe. They were always, uh, I, I remember when I was involved in political, left, new leftist parties in Poland and I wanted to uh, do this work, to like uh, create these bridges, and, but they were saying, uh, no, like, people don't know what they want. Like, literally, they said that. I mean, the paternalistic uh, way of thinking of even young people is super strong, and this is, like, uh, like incredible. Um, I, I have many other comments, but I don't want to talk too much, so maybe I will give you uh, the mic. So you kind of almost responded to my question because I was going to ask you how, how does your Polish side <laughs> relate to your study? So maybe, you know, I can respond that, to that maybe at more, more towards the end and you can do the same and maybe we can gather some questions from the audience. So questions, so, okay. So, like questions from the audience. Yeah. If uh, anyone has a question, I kind of not because I'm kind of, you know, uh, but please try to raise your hand and maybe I'll see you. Okay, I'll see one person. Do we have a microphone? Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, um, is it on? Do no, is it? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's to Angelina because you were saying that uh, it's very important to have like this uh, feedback from theory into practice. Uh, so how do you do that in your movement? Like, How do you kind of feedback your results into this municipalist movement? How, how do I do this dialectical uh, movement from uh, theory and practice and practice yes. and theory? So, so, you, so, so you work as an anthropologist, like how do you feed that back into... Yeah, I, I think I, I, I already told that story. Like I went to Marina Leda uh, trying to write a, a monograph, uh, like an example of another world uh, which is possible. Um, and, and, and then I, I found something totally different. And then uh, the lessons I, 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 um, I took from, from that experience uh, made me to, 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 to think about how it is important to, as I, as I, as I explained here, I think, 
uh, to fight um, the capital, not only from the position of work, but uh, to, to criticize and problematize work within the capitalism, yeah? Because normally we are like saying, no, we need more work and more stable jobs, whatever, but for example, in Spain, it's already obvious that we need to work more, less, that we need to decentralize it, but that it's not the, the, the most beautiful demand, more work, you know? Uh, and, and this is something that I'm implementing, for example, advocating for the universal basic income, decreasing uh, um, sh shorter week, uh, uh, and so on, for example. Uh, or, um, yeah, like the other story that I said was uh, about, about the care crisis. Uh, um, and um, the, the example of, of, of Barcelona, like to create caring cities. Um, okay, this is the theory, how to create it, care municipalism and so on. Then you see in the practice uh, how it works and there are new elements uh, that shows you that uh, it doesn't work well uh, when you do it uh, this way. So once again, you you can you you can back to the to the theory, um, yeah. And I, I also think that uh, there is a lot of theory still uh, like missing. For example, I, I I didn't have time to talk about it, but um, it's super. Uh, it's it's especially painful for me when I'm. Um, Participating in radical movements, and I and I see how many feminist principles uh, just uh, don't work in practice. I mean, known uh, solidarity between women and stuff like that. Uh, many um, many dynamics that reproduce patriarchal uh, logics and so on. And I think that, for example, there is missing uh, some new way of thinking how to how to do that to 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 really put it in practice and stuff like that i mean like uh, there is a lot of things uh, that uh, uh, are still not resolved that's why i would like to uh, invite people also to investigate that movement from the critical uh, um, point of view of course as a critical friend let's say <laughs> So maybe we can collect more questions from the audience, right? So I see someone raising their hand at the back. Uh, so I see one question. Do we have more questions? One? Okay. So one for now. And then we can, Mina, do we have questions on Slido as well? Okay, so questions from the back and then questions from Slido. Hi, so it's my turn, right? Okay. Uh, so many questions, like a million questions raised by these fantastic talks, but I'm going to limit myself to two. <laughs> and I'll make them short, although they're big questions. Uh, the first one is kind of to, to ask you to, to reflect on, on what we've seen about uh, kind of the vulnerability and, and, uh, and, uh, and precarity of anthropologists at this conference, uh, where uh, applied anthropology it has this kind of contradictory genus face, I think, on the one hand, this kind of super radical and 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 critical face that that we've been seeing in this panel, and then on the other hand, the um, the kind of a, a corporate colonization that's been going on. Um, so we're, we're, it's kind of pushing in, in two very very different directions at the same time, which is fascinating. And I'd like to hear your reflections on that. The second one is um, I did my PhD in the U.S. I may be the only person in this room who did that. I'm not sure. Um, and in the U.S., the conversation is very different but also connected. Um, over the last two years, um, there's been uh, the calls to decolonize anthropology have become very, very strong in, in the US, and we've even, we've, we've even heard calls to burn the whole thing down. Um, but in the US, it seems, and I'm on the outside, I'm not there anymore, that uh, the questions are a lot more around the theory, like the corpus, uh, how to decolonize uh, anthropological theory, um, and that seems to be less, less, the, less the accent that, that you two or that this conference has been putting on, but I'd also like to ask what, what, what does all of this mean for the way we use, we use anthropo like classical anthropological theory? Okay, so uh, two questions, uh, one for uh, Angelina, one for Maria. 
uh, from the audience online. Uh, for Angelina, which learnings did you apply, if any, from a small village like Mari Marina Lada to a big hub city like Barcelona? And uh, Maria, what pedagogical recommendations you have for those of us who teach in university settings to discuss precarity at the university? Do you, are there more questions? Do you, do you remember the questions? Do you want me to repeat them? Okay. Okay. So, just in case there are no more questions. Okay. That's, yeah, these are big questions. Um, right. So, the tension between business anthropology and um, radical anthropology. I mean, I, I think if I know universities well enough, I think of them not as a place where you have um, kind of just reproduction of elite or just radical practice, but it's, it is one of the spaces of class struggle. I think anthropology is another one of these places. So if we think of this tension, it is not to be surprising, but it is to be won over. So, you know, for me, it is interesting and indicative that it appears at a conference like this, where it could have been a very easy kind of hub for just activists to speak to each other about things that we know. But it is important that it is trying to, to kind of, you know, it's presented itself here and we have to deal with it. And we have to deal with it as EASA. We have to deal it, it, with it within our own practice as anthropologists. We have to deal with it, you know, as academia. And if you, my, my kind of problem and the reason why probably I was triggered earlier by some of this kind of business talk is that sadly this is nowadays senior management norm normality at university. This is the language that if you teach as myself at the university in the UK, this is your everyday talk from management. Innovation, skills, employability, um, you know, and, and we, we're being talked down upon as if we're some kind of retards that have to learn up to speed, you know. What, and and this, is, this is really humiliating. And it is really making a lot of people suffer silently. But it doesn't produce that much rage and collective anger as uh, permanent faculty not having pension. So this is something that we're still fighting on uh, many levels there. And academia is not an easy institution to organize because of the internalized structures of prestige and hierarchy that is there. And that's another one that we have to work through collectively studying and uh, activating ourselves around. And that to your question about decoloniality. I mean, I'm, my, my issue as somebody that has been also Oh, I was pushed by the boss of my ex, my, my, the ex boss of my ex boss, <laughs> to organize a decolonizing research webinar, because I went to a decolonizing the curriculum uh, meeting, and I said, well, if we don't decolonize research, you know, we can't just speak about this because if we don't hire more, like, faculty of color in for instance, permanent positions, they're always going to be on the periphery. We're never going to have them in this conversation because they don't do core teaching or, you know, research. So why don't we speak also of how we hire them on short-term contracts, what's the global south, global no north uh, kind of division of knowledge, and so forth. And you're like, brilliant, why don't we do a webinar series on that? So we did, you know, and, and it was good, you know, so I thank her for that. But, but you can understand that, um, you know, sometimes the conversations really depend on who, who happens to be at the right time, right place. I happen to be maybe there. And we are now, maybe, with myself and yourself and others in EASA at the right place to start this conversation in anthropology. Can we, can we learn from the US debate? Maybe, maybe not. Can we learn from other associations nationally, you know, in the global south and so forth? Probably yes. So. I would be, you know, I, I have also come not only on an anti-precarity agenda, but also on the decolonizing agenda. I'm just afraid when decolonizing becomes a buzzword and it starts being this thing that senior managers also come to power with, and, and it stops being an actual, like, very 
um, internal practice of self-reflection of what, what are we doing with each other and with our students and colleagues. So I think that was about that. And I'm, now I have uh, the pedagogical... Well, I mean, I guess the, the question about how, how do you use um, precarity as a topic in pedagogy is always a difficult one. Partly because of what I said with this year here within academia. So if you are on the if you are on the bottom of the food chain, you are shamed into where well, you are not good enough. So we are often taught, mostly by you know, especially female, you know, um, or a faculty of color, and who who are in these most vulnerable positions that are running between three different jobs, that are you know not having time to breathe and drink water and pee between sessions and so forth. But um, they're not vocal about that because they're shamed, because they're not good enough, because they, they're not researchers, because you know, they haven't been able to ace the game of academia that champions the people that have been bought out through their labor to do research. They're not doing research either. They hire postdocs to do research for them. Okay, but you know, the managers, again. So, so we're having this, this kind of hierarchy and, and my pedagogical tool, like suggestion is speak about that. Speak to your students about that. It's not shameful. I know it is something very simple to say, and, but, but it is also very simple to do if you, if you stop thinking of this as, you know, like some kind of internalized shame of your deficiency and start thinking of it as a structural position to which my research on precarity helped me. It helped me because I stopped thinking of this, this is like my failure. It was a position in which I saw many others like myself and others in much worse position. And that's why I've been trying together with others in such a situation to, to fight against it. But like if we're invisible to each other and that's the problem with precarity, try that maybe the second pedagogical, it's not to students. Also reach out to your colleagues. When you're in a new department as precarious faculty, don't try just to speak up to the, you know, to the people that might give you jobs. Try to see who are the others around you who are in similar situation. Go to coffee with them, chase them around. It's difficult sometimes because you don't, you hot desk. You know, you don't come to the same way. It, I know it's difficult, I've been in that situation. But, but it is also the only way to build this community that can then uh, allow escaping these silences that otherwise we're crushed under. So maybe there. Join the union. <laughs> uh, Angelina, if you want to comment on any of those questions, and there was also a question for you about the transfer from, uh, I think it was about how, what did you took from a small village to the big city of Barcelona? Um, first of all, I wanted to make some reference to what Maria said and the, the great question. Uh, another, join their union, of course. <laughs> For example, in, in, in my university, Autonomous University of Barcelona, uh, students uh, uh, occupied the streets, like nobody could enter the university, and that's what, uh, for, thanks for, uh, to that, we have one year more of uh, our scholarships. So, I mean, we really can do that, <laughs> that, that things. Another thing is, uh, and this is another uh, field of my expertise, is to uh, be involved for, uh, in implementing the gender equality plans in your universities. You can shape uh, the, the content, content of uh, them, and that's the other reason also why the why the world needs anthropologists because uh, like because I, I work um, on that also like implementing this kind of stuff uh, and uh, people normally when, especially when it comes to the context of the Eastern Europe say but what, what's the problem it's 50 50 like they are focused on numbers like oh, they are 50 percent of women 50 percent of men what's the problem so. They, they don't understand all the things that Maria explained, and uh, that uh, and they like most of researchers who are not anthropologists and who do not who are not trained in observation and um, life stories and so on. Uh, they can't even uh, see that this discrimination and, uh, takes place even in that somebody is not looking at you. I mean, there is a group of people and they are looking at men and nobody looks at you. Like, 
uh, speaking in a group. Like the, this is a daily practice of, 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 of discrimination. And uh, when it comes to this um, very curious format of y your congresses, like uh, um, this Why the World Needs Anthropologists, it was funny for me. When I received the invitation, I, I, I thought, hmm, uh, wasn't that that congress where they talk about business anthropology and user experience and stuff like that? And uh, then I checked out the context, the content, and I and, and I and I've seen, okay, it, the, the, the discourse is radical. I go, uh, but um, but it's like it's it's very. I mean, it, it, it's not good to make this kind of divisions, I think, because, for example, when I started my studies, uh, I remember one of the first days, uh, one of the professors said, if you uh, came here to have a job there, if you really think that the studies will give you a job after them, uh, you can go out. Uh, like, you are not <laughs> here to be trained for, for any job. Uh, you are here to uh, learn to think and to change the system uh, one day. Uh, and it was like, wow, we, we have the, the mission. But of course, then the materialistic uh, um, reality is that how I can change the system if I'm working all the time, competing with other people, and if I'm actually doing also the bullshit jobs, uh, as uh, Maria said. And sometimes uh, if you are doing, I don't know, using experience or whatever, uh, you at least have like a good uh, job um, um, conditions. Sometimes, of course, I, I, I don't know. I know people who work four days a week and then at least you have one day for activism or write a paper. I mean, it's not so, e so uh, this division is not so, 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 so straight, yeah? Uh, let's say. Um, and when it comes to the question about Marina Leda, and that, Marina Leda for me it's a negative, uh, uh, negative example, so I'm not applying uh, lessons from Marina Leda, I'm trying to avoid some dynamics that, I, that, that I've seen there in, in, in Barcelona, that's all. Uh, but I wanted to take advantage that I have uh, the micro and ask uh, Maria about uh, the future of the universities. <laughs> I mean, for example, in Barcelona, uh, it started to, it's starting to be popular that people uh, like me, like you, like many of you, like more radical anthropologists, social scientists, and so on, they set up cooperatives, they uh, ask for grants, and they are starting to do anthropology outside the university because at the university they have this... Um, sorry, I don't want to do this kind of ageism, but that old people that think in a totally different way, uh, that they just tell them collect points because you have to do this and that. Um, so what do you think about it? Like, if, if you have any reflections of that on, on, on that. Yeah, and unfortunately, this has to be the last question yeah. this evening, so I'm sorry about it. Uh, I think it wouldn't be a surprise that I think that a lot of these experiments are limited by the logic of capitalism. So we have to destroy capitalism before we can kind of start. <laughs> before we start this conversation, because I, I, I mean, that, this is happening in Eastern Europe as well. And it's, we are, a lot of the movements, especially nowadays in Hungary, they have very interesting kind of attempt to do cooperativist, um, Enterprise, I mean, quite big with a think tank, with a co-op space, housing, and so on and so forth. So we are looking forward to, you know, their success. But they are also, you know, hitting woes when it comes to not only the authoritarian state, but to market logics. And market logic is something that, you know, is applied. So now that I came to Scotland, and I remember my first academic conference, which was in New Lanark, which was the first utopian community set by Robert Owen. And it failed because of interhuman competition. So there, there's a lot of this dynamic that comes almost from outside and can very easily destroy very well 
minded and very well thought through initiative. So I think what we're still lacking in, in these radical collectives, and I think we can't stop lacking it unless we really have a very critical self-reflection, is what are our internal sanctions and limits? And we don't do that. We believe in our goodness and, and our benevolence, and there's never a sanction of what happens if you know, we, we kind of cross the line, for instance, of, of competition against each other. Or, so I think, you know, with a very serious pinch of salt, maybe some of these experiments can function, but they would end up in the same as, as the Venezuelan case has shown. You know, they would reproduce some hierarchies because we're living in a, in a system that, that kind of almost directly structures in, us into hierarchy and into competition. So how do, we, how do we beat that in its own ground? We probably can't. So we have to think beyond it. It's really hard to say something to conclude this, but I'm just going to say one thing because uh, this is a lot of difficult questions and they don't have easy answers, but the fact that we debated them uh, somehow made me feel less alone in a lot of the things that I'm struggling with and I'm, I think probably you feel the same in the audience, so thank you for that. And this is the end of today's last talk, but it's not the end of today's evening program. <laughs> so thank you again, Maria. Thank you again, Angelina. And I give the, uh, not the mic, but the word to Trude.